Welcome to Basics of Biblical Hebrew, Chapter 1, where we get to study together the Hebrew alphabet. Now, the Hebrew alphabet is, in fact, the oldest alphabet still in use today, dating back almost 4,000 years. So not only will it connect us to the ancient Near East and the Hebrew Bible, but it will also be the very first thing we do together to learn how to read the Bible in Hebrew, the Old Testament. Now, in this chapter, we want to cover three basic things. We want to learn the name of each letter, the form of each letter, and the sound of each letter. The name, the form, the sound. So we'll be working through each letter one at a time. Now, you can follow either in the book or in the charts, but it's very important that you watch on the screen how each letter is written. Now, a couple of things to note before we write these letters. First, the letters as they're written by hand look slightly different than as they appear on the page. Okay? On the page, they have the scripting and the, the bold and the thin parts, uh, the calligraphy sections, and all that good stuff that makes it look nice on the page. Very much like English fonts have all of that flair to them. But when we write English, we write them with simple straight lines or curved lines, and we're going to be doing that, learning how to write the alphabet. Now, when you write the alphabet, you want to practice so that the writing of the letters is clear and crisp each time and that it's not something you're guessing about or fumbling with. And you also want to learn at the beginning to write neatly. Now, I know for all kinds of students out there, handwriting, is some, for some students it's neat, for some students it's sloppy, and there's the whole range in between. But with Hebrew, at the very beginning, the, if, you, if you begin to write neatly and you keep that up, You'll, you'll, you'll have more success as you go on. You'll actually be able to write faster and more legibly as you go. So it, this is a very important skill to work on. And so we're going to work on it slowly, go through all 23 letters, and I'm going to teach you now how to write these letters. All right? So there are 23 letters, each with a distinct form, some with one, some with two pronunciations. We're going to cover all that, but the most important thing you want to get now is how do I write each one of the forms of the Hebrew alphabet? So let's begin. The first letter in the Hebrew alphabet is Aleph, and it's actually silent. It's a silent letter, and we'll talk about the impact that has on pronunciation later, but for now, you just need to memorize that the letter Aleph is silent. It's written with three strokes. There's the back stroke, and then there are two curved strokes. There's an upper curved stroke and a lower curved stroke. That's the letter Aleph. Now, when you're writing on the ruled page in your workbook, you're going to want to fill the entire ruled line with the olive. So let's practice. You should have your workbook out, and you should be practicing writing these letters as I'm writing them for you. So let's begin. Let's write the letter olive four or five times together. We'll begin with the backslash, the upper curved line, and the lower curved line. Again, backslash, upper curved line, lower curved line. Keep going. Two more. Backslash, upper curved line, lower curved line. One more time, backslash, upper curved line, lower curved line. Notice how when I'm writing this letter, the letters are pretty much, for the most part, touching the top part of the ruled line and the bottom part of the ruled line. You want to take up the whole line, the whole ruled line for this. Let's move on to letter number two. The second letter of the Hebrew alphabet is bait, and it sounds like the B in the name boy, or in the noun boy. And uh, the letter bait in Hebrew, when you write it, looks like an upside down J. So let's begin. On the big box here, we're going to write the, uh, the hooked part of the J upside down, and then we're going to give it a base so it doesn't fall over. That's the Hebrew letter bait. The Hebrew letter bait. All right? It also will take up the whole ruled line. So let's practice a couple of times on the small ruled lines above. Here we go. We're going to write the hook and the base the hook and the base, the hook and the base, finally the hook and the base. That's the letter bait, okay? That's the B sound in Hebrew, the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The third letter of the Hebrew alphabet is called gimel, and it's the letter, it's the G sound in Hebrew, all right? So let's, let's look at this letter. This letter is written by a long backslash with kind of a curvy top. All right, long backslash with a curvy top. And then you have to do a support structure right there on the left side. It looks very much like, it looks very much like the, um, the Greek lambda, 
but without this little curve at the top. Okay, the Greek lambda is just straight, whereas in Hebrew, we give it the little curve. All right, so let's practice writing the, the, um, the gimel three or four times in Hebrew. We're going to do that, that curved line, backslash, and then the other diagonal line. Two strokes. One, two. One, two. One, two. Good. That's the letter gimel. That's the G sound in Hebrew. Next, we're going to do the fourth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and that's the dalet or the D sound in Hebrew. The dalet or the D sound in Hebrew. D as in day. Uh, this particular letter is accomplished also with two strokes. There's a horizontal stroke, and then towards the right end of the horizontal stroke, but not all the way to the end, there's a vertical stroke. That's the dalet. Okay? It's very important when you're writing the dalet that you make sure you have that overlap on the right-hand corner of the, the dalet character because it's going to distinguish itself from other letters of the Hebrew alphabet later that have a similar form. So let's practice our dalet with two strokes. The horizontal stroke and then the vertical stroke. One, two, one, two, one, two. That's the dalet. That's the fourth letter of the Hebrew alphabet and it's the D sound in Hebrew. The fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet is pronounced hay, like the hay a horse eats. And it's the H sound in Hebrew, so H as in hay, but the name of it is also hay. So it sounds like H, its name is hay, and it's accomplished with um, two movements of the pen. The first is a right angle. So we're going to create this right angle, all right? And then we're going to do another vertical stroke at the left side of the character all the way down. But notice I've left an opening here. That opening is very important. You're going to want to always make sure that when you write your hay, you've got the opening because that's, again, going to distinguish it from other characters that are similar to the hay. Very important that you get these details down. When I, when I circle or specify or give a particular detail, you're going to want to capture that and memorize that particular detail. So you're always thinking about the fact that the hay has the opening. The hay has the opening. So let's practice some of these hays on our line. We'll do four of them. One will do the right angle, that's one, and then the vertical stroke on the left side, that's two. One, two, right angle, vertical stroke, right angle, vertical stroke. Notice that in every form, I've got that opening right here. Okay, I've got that opening so the wind can get in. All right, you want to make sure that's open every time. That's the letter hey in Hebrew, and it's the H sound, as in hey. Okay. The next letter in the Hebrew alphabet is called wow. This is, I guess, perhaps the most exciting letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the wow. Now, on this particular letter, and we'll talk about this later, there are at least two different pronunciations for it. Some people will prefer to call it vav and pronounce it like a V. Some people prefer to pronounce it or call it wow and pronounce it like a W. Throughout Basics of Biblical Hebrew in these lectures, we prefer the W sound or the wow form of the letter. Uh, that's the traditional form. That's the form, for example, Moses or David would have spoken with. In modern Hebrew, it's pronounced um, as a V sound and called a vav. And that's certainly fine to do if your class does it and your teacher does it or your group of friends do it. You can certainly do it that way. Um, it's just not the traditional pronunciation. And it will make the memorization of Scripture more difficult later. And one of the things I like to emphasize in my own particular classes um, is memorizing blocks of scripture. And if you can, um, if you memorize the sounds in the traditional pronunciation, it'll be easier to spell Hebrew later. So that'll be up to you. But let's look at this. The wow is written in one of two different ways. Uh, the simplest way to write the wow is a simple vertical stroke all the way down. Okay. For me, that's a little plain. I like a little more flair in my Hebrew letters. And so I bend the top of the line a little bit and then go down. That's better. That's a better wow in my book, but you may prefer to go for the quick single vertical stroke. All right? But I'm going to do it this way. Wow. Wow. All right? So let's practice up above. Again, it's going to take the whole length of the ruled line. Here we go. One stroke. Wow. One stroke. Wow. One stroke. One stroke. 
pretty easy consonant to write. It's the W sound in Hebrew, the wow. The next letter that we're going to work on is the Hebrew letter Zion. It represents the Z sound in Hebrew. Now the, the Zion is accomplished with two quick strokes. The first one is a vertical stroke spanning the length of the, the, the line, the length of the section there, and then it has a little slanted line at top. Okay? Notice how the slanted line up here works on both works on both sides. It overlaps the line on both sides. For example, when you have the wow, you just have this little, little break in the line at the top. But the Zion, just to compare it so you don't confuse them, okay, the Zion has the diagonal line and it spans both sides of the line. So you're going to have overlap here and here. Very important to get the Zion right. So two strokes. You have the, the quick vertical stroke and then the diagonal. Quick vertical stroke, diagonal. Quick vertical stroke, diagonal. One last time. Quick vertical stroke, diagonal. That's the Hebrew letter Zion, and it's the Z sound in Hebrew. The next letter that we're going to write is the Hebrew letter Chet. Now, for this letter, you need a little more phlegm in your throat, and you're going to kind of spit it out a little bit in the back of your throat, in that guttural area, the Chet. Now, the Chet looks very similar to the He, Remember with the hay, you had that little that space in there so the air could flow through. But with the chet, it's going to be a right angle with a closed line. Okay, so you're going to create your right angle, but then you're going to go straight down. You're going to create your right angle and then go straight down. Now notice here, there's no opening. With the letter chet, you do not want any opening. It's almost like a rectangle without a baseline. I'm going to write it again for you. I'm going to actually write the hay for you over here so you can see the difference. When you're writing out these forms, the hay and the chet are almost identical, but the difference exists right here. With the hay, there's the space. With the chet, there's no space. Hay and chet. Okay? Now let's practice writing the chet above. Again, it takes the entire ruled line. You can write it in a number of different ways, but I found the easiest way is beginning at the base, moving up, creating the right letter, the right angle, and then going down. Chet. It's three movements. One, two, three. One, two, three. And one, two, three. It's like ballet. You've got your three moves. One more time. One, two, three. Notice that with each letter, this area is closed off. Make sure your chet is always closed. Now this letter, um, in English, you would think of maybe as a rough ch sound or a coughing, when you're coughing trying to say ch. And so it's the, like the ch in Bach. It's got that kind of flimmy guttural sound in it. And so you'll get used to saying it. Some people say it a little harder like Bach. Uh, but you really want to get the flimmy ch sound when you're pronouncing the chet in Hebrew. It's just a lot of fun to do. Don't sit too close to your friends when you're pronouncing this letter at the beginning. You're sure to spit on them. Okay? So the next letter is uh, the tet. Now the tet is um, one of the forms of T in Hebrew. There are actually a couple of forms of the letter T or the T sound in Hebrew. The tet. Now the tet looks like a G that's been rolled back to the left a little bit. Now let me just play around here with you and give you the form of the capital G in English the way we normally do it. We think of it as the letter C with a line. Okay? Now that's actually the fundamental form of the tet in Hebrew, except we're going to roll it back a little bit, and that's going to be our form. So I'll do it here to, so you can see in comparison the tet. You've got the, the C curve with the stroke at the base of the open line. And so you can see here the difference between the two is simply the fact that the tet in Hebrew has been rolled back about 45 degrees. So let's look now. Again, we're going to write the tet with a C that's been rolled back and that stroke. It's two moves. It also is going to take up the entire ruled line above. So let's do this. There's the C stroke and then the line. The C stroke and the line. The C stroke, the line, the C stroke, and the line. And that's the letter tet in Hebrew. 
and it's one of the T sounds. T is in toy. The next letter in the Hebrew alphabet is actually the smallest letter, and it's the Yod, or the Y sound. The Y is in yes, Yod. It's written, some people like to do it as a sharp right angle at the top of the line, or a curve stroke, more of a curve stroke. Either one is fine. I tend to be a little more boxy in my um, Hebrew letter writing, and so we're gonna, I'm going to prefer the more right-angled form. And now, one of the things you need to know in terms of its written form is one, it's the smallest, and, and two, it's written not at the bottom or in the middle, but at the top of the ruled line. So when you're working on the ruled line, we're going to be wor now working up here, we're going to do the, the Hebrew letter Yod, the Y sound, and it's going to be two, it's like a right angle, one, two, one, two, one, two. Okay? Now let me just you write it with the tet that we had in the last letter. Remember the tet is the whole ruled line, but the yod is just part of that at top. Okay, so the yod is the smaller letter, the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet, and it's written at the top of the line, the top of the line. Pretty easy to write, a small right angle. Okay, two, two movements, one and two. Good. The yod, the Y sound, Y as in yes. The next letter in the Hebrew alphabet is Kaf, and it sounds like the K as in king, Kaf, and it's written simply as a backwards C, all right? I think everyone can do this. Here we go, backwards C. We did it. That's Kaf, all right? A backwards C, it's got kind of this big opening right here, and we're going to reproduce that on these ruled lines above, and it's going to take up the whole space. So, Kaf, that's one, two, three, and four. You see it's a backward C and it takes up the entire space on the ruled line that we're working on right here. Kaf. It's the K as in king. The next letter in the Hebrew alphabet is the Lamed and it's the L sound in Hebrew. The Lamed. L as in lion. And it's a fun character to write. There's a little more flair to this letter in Hebrew, especially if you look at the Hebrew manuscripts, for example, some of the Qumran scripts, the Lamed letter is the tallest letter in Hebrew. Remember, we just talked about the Yod, it's the smallest. The Lamed is the tallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. If any of the letters in Hebrew would have played basketball, this is the letter. And it's written like this. It's written well above the line, and then it comes down to the base. It looks, in some sense, like a lightning bolt. Some people prefer to begin at the base and write up. Others prefer to begin at the top and write down. It doesn't matter how you do it, as long as you're consistent and the, the, the character is clean. Let's look at it up here, because one of the important features of the Lamed is that it goes above the ruled line. This is one of those letters that goes above the ruled line. So the Lamed is going to be written beginning at the base and up. The base and up. The base and up. Now, if you want to write it starting at the top, you begin above the line and you come down. Above the line and come down. Above the line and come down. Essentially, where do you think about, when you think about breaking the line, you're going to want to break it right at this midpoint. Right at the midpoint. See, this one is too high. Okay? But these others are right at the midpoint and they're in good shape. This one right here, bad. Don't do that. Okay? So you're going to begin one more time, at the base, break it at the midpoint line, and then go above the ruled line at the top. This, line, this letter is the tallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. It's the Lamed, or the L as in lion. All right, we're halfway there. We're going to be looking at the next set of letters, Mem through Tau. The next letter in the Hebrew alphabet that we're going to learn is the Mem, or the M sound in Hebrew. Now this letter is a little bit tricky because it doesn't look like anything we have in English or Greek or any other language that I'm aware of. It looks in some sense like a mountain. So we're going to create this mountain. But notice at the base of the mountain I curved it in. And at that curved in place it looks somewhat like a nose. So you can think of a combination of a mountain and a nose. But then on the left hand side of the mountain you're going to draw a diagonal line. You can think of it as someone trying to hike up the top of the mountain. So you have a mountain with a line on the left. This is one of the trickier letters in Hebrew to write, and so it may take a little more practice. So we'll do it above here. 
On the ruled line, it's going to take up the entire ruled area, so we're going to begin at the base, curve our line, and then the, the mountain climber. Make a mountain, mountain climber. Make a mountain, mountain climber. Make a mountain, mountain climber. That's the letter Mem in Hebrew, and it sounds like M, the M in mother. This one will take a little more practice to write. It's not going to be as familiar to you at the beginning, but soon it will be second nature to you. The more you practice, the better off you'll be. And one of the things you want to be doing as you're writing out these letters is you want to be not only um, writing the form, but saying the name and perhaps uh, mimicking the pronunciation ma as in mother. The more you employ all your senses in the learning of the language, the faster you'll acquire the language and the better it will stick um, in your brain. The next letter in the Hebrew alphabet is noon. And it is the N sound in Hebrew, the N as in now, or N. And this letter is written very much like the wow, but with a base that goes to the left. So let's begin by writing our wow character. We have this broken line at the top all the way down. That's the first movement. But then we create a horizontal stroke to the left from that wow. That's the noon. Now, just like with the wow, there are, you can simply begin with a straight line a straight vertical line and move to that horizontal baseline. There it looks more like a backwards L. And I don't like backwards L's. I like a little more flair to my Hebrew letters and so I like the break up top. Okay? So here we go. Let's practice this noon four times up top. We have the fancy vertical line. Fancy vertical line. Sorry about that. And then the baseline. One, two. One, two two, one, two. That's the letter noon in Hebrew, and it's the N sound, noon, or the N sound. The next letter in the Hebrew alphabet is the psalmic. It's one of the S consonants in Hebrew. There are a couple for S, and this is the psalmic. It's written as if it were, in some sense, an English zero or O with a little bit of a fancy flair at the top right here as if your zero or O were about to get a baseball cap. And I guess we can do that there. It won't make too much difference. So let me write that again for you. We're going to make our zero or O, and then we're going to give it a little bit of flair at the top, extending, extending beyond the break right here to give it this left-handed um, left line. Now, if you've had Greek, this will look very much like the sigma. However, Hebrew is not written from left to right like Greek. It's written from right to left, and so you can just think of it as a backwards sigma where the, the horizontal line on the top faces the other way. All right? It's pretty easy to make. We're just simply going to make a circle with a line. A circle, but don't stop at the top and go over. A circle that goes over. A circle that goes over. That's the psalmic in Hebrew, and it's one of the S sounds or S consonants in Hebrew. Psalmic. The next letter in the Hebrew alphabet is ayin, and it's one of those silent letters. It's like all if it's silent. We'll, we'll tell you how that works later. And this letter is written like a Y, but the base of it is curved horizontally. So uh, let me just compare it with a Y. In English, a Y has a, a straight diagonal line and then a, another line connecting that goes the other way. The ion in Hebrew is very similar to that, except rather than a straight line, as we have with the Y, we're going to bend the line over here. We're going to bend the line. Okay? So the ion looks like a Y. It doesn't sound like a Y. The ion looks like a Y, and it's got the curved line at the bottom. Let's practice that. It's also going to take up our whole area. We're going to write the ion two strokes, the curved Y line and then the back stroke. The curved line and the back stroke. One more time, the curved line and the back stroke. Now you can see when you're writing the ion that its base is going to rest right on the base of the ruled line. And then at the top it's going to touch the top of the ruled line. Okay, so it's going to take up the entire section and it's going to, it's going to have that bent um, Y looking shape to it. Okay? Good. The next line we want to learn is the pay. Now the pay 
uh, can be written very much like the tet, which is ver written very much like the English capital G. And so let me show you the progression here. It might help. All of them begin with a C shape. The G is a regular C with that horizontal, with that vertical stroke at the base of the opening. The tet, we roll back a little bit. We still make the C and our horizontal line goes at the base of the opening. Well, the pe is going to be a backward C and our horizontal line is going to go at the top. All right, it's as if we've flipped over and reversed the English capital G. So we can see the progression here. Here's, the, here's where we begin with G, then we roll it over for the tet, then we keep rolling it over for the pay. Okay, so let's practice this. It's very easy. Ready? Backwards C, and then a line. Backwards C, then a line at the top of the opening. Again, a backward C and a line at the top of the opening, a backward C and a line at the top of the opening. So this is the better looking character of my poorly handwritten ones previously. And so you want to get it to look just like that. Um, this form is good. Okay. It's, it's like a G, like a tet, like a pay. And you just keep rolling that, that letter over. That's the pay. It's the P sound in Hebrew. The P is in pastor, P. The next letter of the Hebrew alphabet we're going to work on is tzade. And the tzade is pronounced like the T-S in boots. It's more like a hissing sound or the letting the air out of a tires that sound in Hebrew, T-S. It's written with two strokes, two movements. Um, if, if you're familiar with the mathematical notation, the greater than sign, you begin with that stroke, the greater than sign, and then halfway through the top, a diagonal line. Okay? It looks like a Y that was in a car accident where the leg was broken midway through. Okay? So we want to do our greater than sign and then the other diagonal stroke. The greater than sign, diagonal stroke, greater than sign, diagonal stroke. One more time, the greater than sign, diagonal stroke. That's the tzade, the T-S sound in Hebrew. The next letter we're going to do in the Hebrew alphabet is the kof, the kof. It's um, like the K in king, like the, like the cough we learned earlier, but it's a little more back in the throat. You can think of there's king, where the pronunciation is more forward in your mouth, but then you can try to pronounce king slightly further in the back, beginning deeper in your throat, king. Very slight difference. You probably won't hear it in, in class, but just so you know that there is a slight difference between the cough in Hebrew and the kof in Hebrew. There's a K and a K sound back in the throat. Maybe indistinct. Some professors will like to emphasize this more than others, and you simply follow the lead of the people you're studying with. Okay? Now the kof is simple. It begins with a vertical stroke, and then it, it looks like you're going to make a P with it. Now, some individuals will prefer you to keep that open, and that's certainly how it looks um, in the typed script. Some folks will just think it's okay to write something like this, where you've got no opening there. Because the letter kof in Hebrew doesn't have any other letters with which it conflicts in terms of appearance, it doesn't matter really how you write this one. Typically, however, is the best way to do it is probably this form right here, where you've got the slight opening. Um, additionally, this, this particular letter is going to dip below the line, and we can't do it down here, but above, it, above we'll show you the kof is going to go a little bit below the line, and then the P shape at the top. So you're going to want to do a vertical line, perhaps that's overkill, with the P. A vertical line with the P, a vertical line with a semicircle back shape that makes it look a little bit like a P. Okay? In terms of relative length, we're looking something like this below the line. Not too far, but something below the line to make it distinct. That's the kof. That's the K sound in, in um, Hebrew. It may sound, may perhaps one way to think about it 
is the slight difference between the, the harder K and the Q in English, although those also get blended together. And so two very, the Kof and the Kof very close um, in terms of pronunciation for Hebrew. We're almost at the end. Just four more letters. This, this next letter is the Resh or the R in Hebrew. It's very easy to write, one, one simple stroke. It's like a shepherd's crook or a curved upside down J. I usually begin at the top and then curve the line down to the base. That's the Hebrew letter resh. It's the R sound in Hebrew, R as in run, the R sound. Now, one of the things I want to point out with this particular letter is notice up here it's bent or curved. It's not a hard right angle and there's no overlap in terms of the writing. In some Hebrew Bibles and in some printed manuscripts, it's difficult to distinguish sometimes between the Dalit and the Resh. Remember, the Dalit is a hard right angle with this overlap. A hard right angle with the overlap. The Resh has no overlap and it's a bent line. A bent line. That's the distinguishing feature of the Resh. So let's practice on the ruled lines above. Here we go. The Resh, you begin at the top and it's curved down. Begin at the top and curve down. Begin at the top and curve down one more time. It looks a little bit like a shepherd's crook. There you go. Um, it, this is the same movement that you would um, use to write the letter bait. You do the same curved line in some sense, but then with the bait you have the base on it. With um, the resh, there is no base. There is no base, but same basic movement. Resh. The R sound in Hebrew. Okay, the next two letters, sin and shin, are written in the same way, or the same basic form, but there's only one dot that distinguishes them. Now, um, some people, when they count the letters of the Hebrew alphabet, they'll say there are only 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And, and the way they get 22 letters is because they're combining sin and shin. And the reason they do that is because in Hebrew acrostic poems, frequently, sin and shin just appear as a single letter. And it's got the same basic form, and so they'll count it as one. For our intents and purposes, we're going to count them as two letters for two reasons. One, they have two pronunciation values. And two, when you're looking up words in a Hebrew lexicon or a Hebrew dictionary, there's a sin section, a sin, there's a sin section, if you can say that. There's a sin section in the lexicon or the dictionary, and there's a shin section. So uh, practically speaking, they're two different letters, and if you switch them up on a word, it makes a different word. So if you switch a sin for a shin on a Hebrew letter, it's not the same word. So we're going to count them as two distinct letters, and so we're going to count 23 letters in our Hebrew alphabet, not 22. Now, the same base form is, is used for both sin and shin, so I'm going to teach you how to write them both together. The first form we're going to do is sin, and it's the S sound as in the S in Sin, or the S in Sally, or the S in Sam. And it's written as a broad U. You want plenty of space in your big U. And then you're going to have a diagonal stroke to the left, ending up on the left-hand side of your U. Okay, do you see that? Now the Sin is distinguished from the Shin by a dot over the very left fork of the Sin. Okay. Now the shin is written exactly like that. Let me write the shin on the left side. I'm going to make a big wide U, a diagonal backstroke, and then instead of making my dot on the left, I'm going to make it on the right. Okay? The sin is pronounced as a simple S. The, the shin is pronounced as an SH sound, like in, he kicked me in the shin, or the SH in ship. Okay? The only difference in form between the sin and the shin is the placement of the dot. The sin has the dot on the left, the shin has the dot on the right. So let's practice writing these above. First we'll begin with a couple of sin forms. We're going to make our big U, diagonal stroke, dot. Big U, diagonal stroke, dot on the left. One more, big U, diagonal stroke, dot on the left. Okay. Now the shin is the exact same form, big U, diagonal stroke, dot on the right. Big U, 
diagonal stroke, dot on the right. So with this particular character, one form, two sounds, you distinguish the two sounds or forms by the placement of the dot. Sin on the left, shin on the right. Sin on the left, shin on the right. Sin and shin. The last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, congratulations, here we go, is tau. Now some people will pronounce this as tav. It doesn't really matter how you pronounce the name of the letter, tau or tav. It's the T sound as in toy. And we're going to write it, and it's going to be a combination of different letters you've learned in some sense. It's going to begin with a vertical stroke up, right angle to the left, vertical stroke down, and a little leg. Okay? This little leg at the bottom is very important. Very important. It will distinguish the chet from the tau. Now I'll write them a little smaller side to side. The chet is simply up to the left and down. The tet is fundamentally the same movement with one added feature. You're going to go up to the left, down, little leg. The difference is right here. Okay? So it's going to be one, two, three, four different lines. We're going to write four different lines there. So let's practice the tau together in our ruled line. Ready? We're going to go up, over to the left, down, little leg. Up, over to the left a little bit, down, little leg. Up, to the left, down, and leg. One more time. Up, to the left, down, and leg. Fantastic. That's the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Now, one of the things you may have noticed as I'm working on these letters is the direction of my practice is not left to right, but in fact right to left. And this is a very important feature of the Hebrew language. The Hebrew alphabet is not written from left to right as it is in Greek or English. All Hebrew letters or all Hebrew writing is written not from left to right, but from right to left. And so on the slide, you'll be able to see that the direction of the writing of the Hebrew alphabet, beginning with Aleph on the right, ending with Tau on the left. So you're going to write, in some sense, backwards. Now the Hebrew person didn't think of the writing as backwards. And in fact, in very ancient Hebrew inscriptions, the writing of the direction wasn't necessarily set. Sometimes it'd be left to right, sometimes right to left, sometimes up and down, sometimes left to right, right to left, left to right, right to left. All that to say is there was some fluidity in how it was written 4,000 years ago. It's not 4,000 years ago, and everything in Hebrew now is written from right to left. And for example, then, books don't open at the left in Hebrew. Books open in what you would consider the back in Hebrew, and they'll open at the right, and you'll open it up, and you'll read right to left. So it's very important that when you're practicing the Hebrew alphabet, you do not do this. I'm going to write this on the board here. You do not begin on the left and write Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalit, etc. This is bad. This does not occur in Hebrew. We do not write letters left to right. We only write them right to left. And so when you're practicing the Hebrew alphabet, you want to write them this way. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch paper here, and I'm going to write out the Hebrew alphabet for you in a proper fashion, and I'm going to say the name and write the form. Say the name, write the form. All 23 letters. This is what you want to be practicing to do. Before you continue on to chapter 2 in the grammar, you need to be able to write out from memory all 23 letters of the Hebrew alphabet from left to right. So we're going to begin on the left. Here we go. Aleph. Bait. Gimel, Dalit, Hey, Wow, Zion, Chet, Tet, Yod, Kaf, Lamed, above the line. Mim, Noon, Samic, Ion, P, 
pe tsare kof resh sin with a dot on the left shin with a dot on the right and finally tau those are the 23 letters of the hebrew alphabet and you want to be able to write them out and say their names as you progress you'll also want to begin to learn how these words sound in their context now in some sense it's difficult to know exactly how these sound until you put vowels in it in chapter two so for now you need to learn the basic for example you need to learn that the hebrew letter bait is written with this form and has the b sound as in boy the hebrew letter zion is written like this and has the z sound as in zebra okay you can begin at that level for this chapter okay that's the essence of this chapter the name the form and the sound of the hebrew alphabet letters there are 23 letters now before we move on there are a few things you need to know about the hebrew alphabet in addition to the name the form and the sound okay now there's not a lot here but you need to know that the alphabet has a couple of interesting characteristics or features that we need to study the first thing that we need to study when it comes to the hebrew alphabet is that there are five letters in the hebrew alphabet that have two distinct forms there's a, a medial form or a form of the letter that we just learned that can occur at the beginning or in the middle of a letter there are also with these particular five forms uh, a distinct way in which the letter is written if it occurs at the end of a word now if you've had greek you'll recognize that the greek sigma or you'll remember that the greek sigma has two different forms there's the regular sigma for if the sigma occurs at the beginning of its word or in the middle of a word but the sigma is written a little bit different if it appears at the end of its word that's exactly like hebrew okay there are five letters in hebrew that have two distinct forms now you could ask well what is the reason for this well some of it is perhaps just to sanctify us and cause us to learn five distinct forms for these uh these five letters but one of the features about hebrew and manuscript traditions in general is that early on in the stages of copying hebrew manuscripts uh, paper was at a premium and writing was very difficult and storage was very difficult and and so there were no spaces between words because of that certain forms developed into final forms and those final forms helped the the reader identify the end of a word now thankfully all 23 letters don't have two distinct forms but there are certain letters that for one reason or another have a different final form and so these are also important to memorize um, with your regular form so there's going to be a regular form you can think of it that way and a final form a regular form and a final form so let's begin with the, the letters that have these five different features um, there are the five letters that have two different forms are kof mem noon pe and sade so i'm going to begin writing those five forms the regular way kof mem noon pe and sade okay kof mem noon pe and sade now the final kof is written as if it were a dalit but it goes well below the baseline okay you'll see here with this final form you have the the sharp break with the overhang that is characteristic of the dalit but what distinguishes the dalit from the cough is the fact that the cough the final cough goes well below the line it goes well below the line okay let me write that again for you the cough is written like a dalit but it goes well below the line that's the cough the final form of the cough now there is no change in pronunciation a regular cough and a final cough are pronounced the same way it's the form that is distinct these final forms occur only when the, the letter is at the end of a word, the last letter in a word. The mem, the final form of the mem, is, is in some sense peculiar. It begins with a right angle on the left, and then it sweeps back up in a curve to the left. Let me do that again for you. A right angle with a curve back to the top. A right angle with a curve back to the top okay now the mem in some sense is a little more square in its final form 
than the regular form. You can think of it that way. Okay, one more time. The MIM is, for some reason, students normally have a little bit of difficulty with the MIM, both in its regular form and final form. And so we're going to write it again. It's a simple right angle, but now we're going to curve the line to the top. Very good. Sometimes there will be this little overhang, and that's not a big deal. Okay? Um, sometimes there will be no overhang, like right here. All right? As long as you're consistent and you follow the pattern um, consistently or follow the pattern that your instructor gives you in class, you'll be in good shape. Okay? The noon, the final noon, looks as if the horizontal stroke at the bottom was bent down and straightened out. So we're going to begin by writing the same basic noon, but instead of stopping it there, we're going to continue it below. Okay? Noon. Noon. You can see here that with the final noon, it goes well below the line, well below the line, well below the line in each form. It's as if you take this horizontal stroke and you bend it down. Now the difference between the noon and the wow then, just so you know, the wow stops at the baseline. The noon goes well below the baseline. So you don't want to get these two forms confused. At the beginning you may, but here's the key. The final noon only occurs as the last letter of a word. The final noon occurs only as the last letter of a word, and so you're not going to see it any other place. Final pay. Again, the final pay looks as if this bottom curved line was simply straightened out. Okay? And so we're going to do it. We're going to write as if we're writing that C but instead, of stop, but instead of stopping at the baseline, we're going to go well below that baseline, and then we're going to finish it off by writing our normal horizontal stroke. So here we go again. The curve J that goes below the line, the stroke. The curve J that goes below the line, the stroke. So the key feature here is recognizing the fact that it goes below the line. The sade is similar. The same thing happens, that this little curved line right here gets straightened out, and it looks more like a regular Y, where you've got that first stroke going well below the line. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to practice here, see if I can do on this baseline. What we're going to do is instead of, instead of breaking the line like a greater than sign, it's going to go below the line, and then we're going to do our backstroke. Below the line and backstroke. Again, the key thing here is this line that goes below. Okay? Now watch. I want to point this out to you, and I'm going to clear this page to do it. I'm going to write these five letters again for you quickly. Okay? We're going to do cough, mem, noon, pay, and sade. What you'll notice is that with the cough, the noon, the pay, and the sade, all of those characters, when they're written in their final form, will have a, have a straight line that goes below the baseline. So here we've got these baselines, these letters all at the baseline, all at the baseline. Four of the five final forms simply get straightened out at the bottom. Okay? Long line at the base. Long line. Long line below the baseline. Long line below the baseline. So those four, those four final forms share that feature where the bottom part of the line gets straightened out. The MIM is unique, and perhaps that's why it gives students trouble. It's that right angle followed up by that curved line. Again, let me do the MIM. The right angle followed up by the curved line. Okay? So in addition to the 23 letters of the Hebrew alphabet that we just learned, you need to learn that five of those letters have final forms. Those final forms occur when that particular letter is written at the end of a word. It's got the same pronunciation value, just a slightly different form that's at the end. The next thing you need to learn, and this perhaps is a little trickier, is that six letters in Hebrew, six letters in Hebrew have two different pronunciation values. Two different pronunciation values. Now the pronunciation values are related, but they are distinct, and when you're writing Hebrew and pronouncing Hebrew, as much as possible, you're going to want to maintain the distinction. Okay. Now, do we have this in English? Yes, we have this in English. For example, think of the English letter C. We have the C as in cat, where we have a hard C. 
but then we have the C as in celery, where it's the softer, slippery C, K and S. Same thing with the English letter G. We have the hard G as in get, G, but we have the softer G as in giant, J, the G and the J. So in English, we have the, sa the same reality. There's one letter, two different pronunciations. They're related. G and J are related. Okay? Now we're going to have that same thing happening in Hebrew. Now we have a name for these six letters, and it's a funny name, but it will be helpful. The name of these letters is, the name, of this, the name that we give these letters are Begad Kafat letters. Let me say it again, Begad Kafat letters. The Begad Kafat letters in Hebrew are the six consonants that have two pronunciation values, Begad Kafat. Now where did we get such a crazy name? The Begad Kafat name comes from the listing of all of those consonants that are or have those two values. So, if you can say Begad Kafat, you're going to be able to come up with the six letters that are written that way in Hebrew. The slide will show you that, but I'm going to write it out as well. Here they go. Begad Kafat is Beit, Gimel, Dalit. That's Begad. B-G-D. Begad. And then we have Kafat. Kaf, Pei, and Tau. Begad, Kafat. Let's think of it as two words run together, begad, kafat. Now, how do we distinguish between the soft sounds like the G in giant or the hard sounds like the G in git? That's the, that's the basic feature that distinguishes these letters. These letters will have two pronunciations. One will be hard and one will be soft. Now, what do I mean by hard? By hard, it means that when you're pronouncing them, you will typically stop the flow of air through your mouth. Ba G, D. Okay? In order to pronounce these words, you stop the flow of air through your mouth. When they're soft, you force more air through your mouth. You don't stop them entirely. V, G, and V. More air goes through them. Now, with these two pronunciation values, you have to distinguish them in Hebrew. The way in which you do that is with a dot. And this dot is called the doggish lane. Let me write this out for you. The doggish lane. The doggish lane is a small dot placed in the middle of a Bagad Kafat letter to distinguish between the hard and the soft pronunciations. Okay? Letters with the hard pronunciation get the dot or the doggish lane. Letters with the hard pronunciation get the dot or the doggish lane. So let me show you how some of this works. We're going to begin with just the first three letters of the Bagad Kafat letters the bait, the gimel, and the dalit. I'm going to write these out. We'll begin with bait. Bait, gimel, and dalit. Okay? By themselves, without the doggish lane, these letters are pronounced with the soft pronunciation. Now the soft pronunciation for the bait is like a V in the letter vine, V. The soft letter for the gimel is like the GH in a gast. There's a little more air that flows through it, or you can think of the G in giant where there's the J sound. And the soft pronunciation of the D or the Dalit is like the TH sound in the. Now, that's a little trickier, but we'll get there. Okay, we'll get it. Let me show you what the doggish lane looks like. The doggish lane is a small dot in the middle of a letter. There you go. That's the doggish lane in the bait, the doggish lane in the gimel and the doggish lane in the dalit. Now, here we go. Let's work on this a little bit. The hard pronunciation is B, as in boy. The soft pronunciation is V, as in vine. So when you encounter the bait in Hebrew, you're going to have to think in your mind. I've got two options. It can be B or V. How do I know? Simple. If there's no dot in it, you're going to have the V. If there is a dot in it, that's the doggish lane that gives you the hard sound, and it's going to be the B sound, the hard B. Okay? Let's try it with the gimel. If there's no dot in the gimel, if there's no dot in the gimel, you're going to have the soft sound, which will be the GH sound, as in a gast or the G in giant. However, 
the moment you put the doggish lane in it, you now have the hard sound, the G, as in get. Same thing happens with the dalit. If you get rid of the doggish lane, you're going to have the TH sound, as in the. So let's do that. TH. But the moment we put that doggish lane back in there, the dot in the middle, it's going to give us not the soft sound, but the hard D sound. The D is in day. All right? These are the Bagad Kafat letters. This is the first three, the bait, the gimel, and the dalit. All right? Let's look then at the second set of Bagad Kafat letters, the kaf, the pay, and the tau. We're going to do the same thing. I'm going to write them out. Here we have kaf. Here we have pay. And then we have tau. Okay? Now let's do it this way. Let's begin by giving the soft pronunciations. The soft pronunciation of the cough is the one we've learned. It's the CH as in Bach. So it's got more of a flim sound to it. Bach. The CH as in Bach. Okay? The soft pronunciation of the PE is like a PH sound, like in the English word phone or alphabet. You can also think of it as the F sound in, in English. It sounds like an F. Okay? And finally, the tau, when the tau does not have a doggish lane in it, it's soft and its pronunciation is th. Th as in uh, thin, the th in thin, th, thing, thin, thing, these. That th sound derives from the tau without the doggish lane. So, ch, f, and th. Okay? Now, the moment we put the doggish lane into these letters, they will shift from the soft sound to the hard sound. And now we won't get the, the softer CH, we're going to get the harder K sound as in king, the harder P sound as in prophet, and the harder T sound as in toy. Okay? Now, so this means that you've learned two additional things besides the alphabet. Not only do you have to learn the alphabet, but you also have to learn that five letters in the Hebrew alphabet have final forms. But you also have to learn that six letters in the Hebrew alphabet have two pronunciations. Two pronunciations. The, the letters of the Hebrew alphabet that have two pronunciations are called collectively the Begad Kafat letters. The Begad Kafat letters. Good. We're almost done with this chapter. The last basic thing you need to know about the Hebrew alphabet is that there's a certain classification of some of the letters, and that those letters are called the guttural consonants. Four letters in Hebrew are known as guttural consonants, and we call them guttural consonants because they're pronounced in the back of the throat. Okay? The only thing you have to know now about guttural consonants is that they are, in fact, guttural consonants. There are four of them. I'll write them out for you so we can continue to practice our writing. The four letters of the Hebrew alphabet that are guttural consonants are Aleph, Hey, Chet, and Ayan. These four letters are known as guttural consonants because they're pronounced, when they are pronounced, in the back of the throat. There's one additional letter that I want to alert you to, and it's Resh. The Resh is called a semi-guttural. Sometimes it acts like a guttural, and sometimes it doesn't. For now, you don't need to know that. You just need to know that the four gutturals are Aleph, Hey, Chet, and Ayan. And there's one semi-guttural race. That's all you need to know. You can put it on a flash card. You can write it on the back of your hand. You can memorize it however you want. But you simply need to know that there are four and a half letters that are gutturals. Last slide for this chapter. The last thing you need to know, and this will become more and more apparent um, depending on the, the context in which you're taking first year Hebrew, is that there is a slight difference in pronunciation between what is known as Biblical or Classical Hebrew, the traditional pronunciation, and Modern Hebrew, modern pronunciation. Some instructors and in even some schools or communities will prefer to have an entirely modern pronunciation. And that's completely fine. Uh, as long as you're consistent, it will work for you. Other schools and other groups of people like their traditional pronunciation, and that's fine too as long as you're consistent and you're agreed upon it in form. All right? Which system are we going to use? We are going to use the traditional system. Why? 
for two reasons primarily. Number one, the traditional system is the system that most closely approximates the original pronunciation of Hebrew, or at least the traditional and preserved pronunciation of Hebrew. By using the traditional pronunciation, it'll be easier to memorize biblical text and to write it out. Meaning this, if you say it right, you can write it correctly. Now that doesn't work in English. The English spelling system is very discombobulated. So the way in which you say something isn't necessarily the way in which it's spelled. In Hebrew, with the traditional pronunciation, if you can say it, you can spell it. And that really aids in pronunciation. All right, so there's that. So one, it's the traditional or preserved pronunciation. Two, it helps you memorize scripture. And for me, that's a big part of my teaching in my own life. And so I want to be able to write it and say it together. Okay? Now, if you use the modern pronunciation, that's fine. But let's go over that. Basically, it comes down to three Begad Kafat consonants and the Wow consonant. Now, with three of the Begad Kafat consonants, the Gimel, the Dalit, and the Tau, the Gimel, the Dalit, and the Tau, in modern Hebrew, there is no, di no difference between the form with a doggish lane and the form without a doggish lane. For the Gimel, the Dalit, and the Tau, there's only one pronunciation, and it's always the hard pronunciation, the G, the D, or the T, for the Gimel, the Dalit, or the Tau. The fourth difference is that in modern Hebrew, they prefer, as I've mentioned earlier, that the wow to be pronounced as a V sound, and they call it Vav. That's the only difference. So if you know those four differences, you know the basic differences between pr uh, pronouncing Hebrew in its traditional form and its more modern form. Doesn't matter which form you use as long as you're consistent. As long as you're consistent. Well, that does it for us. Uh, that's the end of chapter one. I look forward to seeing you in chapter two. Uh, before you move on, please be sure that you can write out the 23 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Please be sure that you know the five final forms Please be certain that you can um, identify the Begad Kafat letters and know the soft and the hard pronunciations that are distinguished by what is called the Dagish Lene. And then you may or may not want to know the difference between modern and traditional pronunciation. In this series of lectures and in the grammar, we will use consistently the traditional pronunciation. I'll see you next time.